Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, previewing the 2022 election, our line opinion panel analyzes the latest polling in state and congressional races. And I think what people are looking for is not partisanship in this election and in this race. They are looking for solutions and people who are willing to fight uh, for New Mexico and New Mexicans. The final interviews in our series of candidate conversations. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Election day is just days away, and some of New Mexico's major races are looking tighter than ever. New polling shows Republican challenger Mark Ronchetti pulling within three points of Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. In about five minutes, I'll ask our line opinion panel if an endorsement from Donald Trump could help close that gap. And in less than 15 minutes, we'll hear from the governor on her plans if she's reelected. We're also keeping a close eye on a congressional race that's looking more and more like a toss up. A recent poll shows Democratic challenger Gabe Vasquez is ahead of District 2 Rep Yvette Harrell, but another shows Ms. Harrell with a large lead. I'll ask which poll we should trust and what each candidate needs to do to solidify their position. We're also going to hear from candidate Gabe Vasquez in the second half of the show. He sits down with correspondent Gwyneth Dolan to talk about key issues for New Mexicans in District 2. But we begin tonight with an update from the Secretary of State before Election Day. In recent weeks, Secretary Maggie Toulouse Oliver has warned about the possibility of partisan poll watchers and other potential disruptions. On Wednesday, senior producer Lou DeVizio caught up with the Secretary on Facebook Live to ask why New Mexicans should be confident their votes are safe and secure. Secretary, thank you for joining me. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Lou. Of course. Uh, we wanted to see thing, how things were going on your end ahead of November 8th. That's after your office spoke to the media about potential for partisan poll watchers gathering at voting sites. We've heard instances of intimidation in other states like Arizona. First off, are you aware of any similar incidents or tactics being used here in New Mexico at any early voting locations? Well, the, the good news is not at this point. You know, we're six days out from Election Day as you and I are speaking live here. Uh, and uh, so far, so good. Uh, we're not seeing the kind, the same kind of intimidation tactics that we're seeing in other places. I'm hopeful that, you know, the work that we've done in advance to let voters and folks who are part of the, the observation process know what is legal, what is not okay at a polling place has, has done its job. Um, but of course, we do have a, a few days left of early voting. And of course, a big day uh, this coming Tuesday, November 8th on Election Day uh, to see uh, hopefully uh, people keep just doing the right thing. Voters continue to vote and uh, we continue to see a, a relatively trouble-free election process here in New Mexico in 2022. Now, your office recently made voting machines available, available to the media to show how they worked and to assure voters that everyone's vote would be counted safely and securely. Have you gotten any feedback since that demonstration? And do you think that it helped ease some people's concerns? Well, the feedback we've received so far has been extremely positive. Um, I think the more that we can do either here at the state level or at the local county level, and I know a number of the counties have done similar demonstrations in their communities. Travis County recently did one uh, that was uh, put together by both the Democratic and the Republican parties in that area to show uh, you know, that there is sort of a joint effort, regardless of partisanship, uh, to make sure that voters and, and citizens are aware of how this process works and how the machines work. Um, unfortunately, I think there's always going to be a small but vocal group of people that, um, you know, despite every piece of information we provide, are going to want to continue to believe and cling to mis and disinformation about how our processes work. But at the end of the day, I think the more we can do to make this process transparent, to make the mechanics of the election, including how the voting machines work transparent, it seems to have a positive impact and we're gonna keep doing that. Now, many of the key races in this cycle are expected to be close. Does that concern you at all when it comes to the general public and that small but vocal majority that you mentioned accepting results, especially after 2020? 
Sure, I, I I certainly think we're going to see. Uh, you know, we we have a close race for the for Congress in the second congressional district. We have a number of very potentially close uh, races for the state House of Representatives. Uh, you know, it's a little unclear how many we will have at the statewide level, but you know, I think the the challenge is so here in New Mexico, we do have automatic recount processes in place. So if we do have these races that are falling within per particularly close margins, we will automatically recount those results. We have the post-election audit that we're going to do that's going to spot check our machines and make sure they counted ballots accurately uh, with those official election results. Um, but I think my bigger concern is that even in races that are not close, uh, that are, you know, that where there is a clear victor, um, that unfortunately there are still going to be some folks out there who are really bought into the, the frankly, the flat out lies about how our election process works that could, um, you know, potentially uh, raise a fuss about election outcomes and, and sort of refuse to participate or look at the outcome of these transparent, transparent bipartisan processes that we have in place. So that's always a concern. We're going to be on the lookout for it and ready to deal with it when and if it happens. Thank you to Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver for her time. You can watch Lou's entire conversation with the Secretary online right now on the New Mexico in Focus Facebook page. Now it's time to introduce our line opinion panelists for the week. Welcome back, Daniel Foley, former New Mexico State Representative, Attorney Laura Sanchez, always good to have Laura with us, and Dave Mulryan, President of Mulryan Nash Advertising. Thank you all for being here. Now we're looking ahead to Election Day Tuesday, starting with several state races, namely the race for governor. According to new polling from Emerson College, released by KRQE 13 News, 50% of voters view Michelle Lujan Grisham favorably, while 49% of voters see Mr. Ron Ketty as favorable. Overall, 49% of people polled plan to vote for Ms. Lujan Grisham, while 46% plan on voting for Mark Ron Ketty. But that poll came out before Donald Trump formally endorsed Mr. Ron Ketty on Monday. And Dave Mulryan, obvious question here, will that help him close the gap? Because he needs something here. He's kind of floating in space not able to really get over the hump here. Is that going to do it for him? Is that going to hurt him with moderates? I, I mean, possibly, but mm -hmm. just so that we're aware of what's going on, you know, with the numbers, um, as of yesterday, 383,300 Democrats had early voted, 273,904 Republicans had early voted, and interestingly, uh, declined to state people with no party affiliation 121,000 so there is a lot of vote that's already banked you know mm -hmm. when you look at it and I'm not sure that at a late date that you know a Donald Trump endorsement I never got the sense that Donald Trump was a big player in New Mexico I could be wrong but mm -hmm. just that was my sense you know and just stuff so I mean he did not get along with Susanna Martinez and I don't know if people remember that if Republicans remember that I, I don't know it's not clear I just like a lot of things Donald Trump does, it's just unclear whether his endorsement helps you or hurts you. Who mm -hmm. knows, mm -hmm. right? That's a good point. Laura, uh, Dave mentioned last time around Mr. Biden defeated Mr. Trump by 11 points here, <laughs> which turns out to be more than 10,000 votes. It's a lot of votes in New Mexico. Is this, is this going to move the needle at all for Mr. Ronchetti? Well, I mean, I think the real question is, how mm -hmm. does this impact the um, swing voters? Ah. Right? Because you figure that people who are already staunchly... Um, Ronchetti, which are probably, you know, my guess would be they're Trump supporters or could be Trump supporters. Um, they're going to vote for him regardless. And mm -hmm. then there's people who are going to be really turned off by by this. Probably a lot of Democrats very turned off by a Trump endorsement. So they were already not going to vote for him anyway. Yeah. So it's that middle swing vote, right? The people who are potentially declined to state, but there's a fair amount of people who are also registered independent. There's people who are registered in one of the parties, but they vote independently. Mm -hmm. So I think the real question is, are those people um, turned off by Donald Trump or um, are they in, are they inclined to vote for someone just because of Trump's endorsement? Mm -hmm. um, I, I cynically, I think, I mean, I think a Trump endorsement is, hurts a candidate like Ron Ketty in this state. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are some states where a Trump endorsement helps. Um, but in this state, when you saw such a huge uh, margin between the two candidates in the last election um, and so much of the rhetoric, I just don't see it helping Ron Ketty, especially in the areas where he needs more votes. I mean, he's doing well in the South. Right. That's not a surprise. Um, oil and gas country, more conservative parts of southern New Mexico. Um, and also, you know, the San Juan area where it's also, you know, heavy oil and gas 
sort of um, industry. And I think in those areas he's doing he's doing well. But if you look at where he needs to pull votes from, the Albuquerque, you know, central New Mexico area, northern New Mexico, they're not going to be likely to um, be persuaded by a Trump endorsement. If anything, they'll be turned off by that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Daniel, as we tape this, President Biden's in town and, uh, and of course, campaigning for Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. And I bring this up to say his approval ratings haven't exactly been stellar lately. Um, in, in the same sort of vein as Mr. Trump helping Mr. Ronchetti, is Mr. Biden helping our governor here, or are these things just a wash at the end of the day? So first, let me say, since we're talking about these races, Gene, that I've donated money to both sides of these races this year. I mean, I've got Democrats I've given money to and Republicans I've given money to. So. You know, uh, I'm equally as jaded. I think, uh, you know, I think it's I think it's interesting. Uh, Laura's take, and I appreciate her her comments being the good Democrat that she is. I'm not sure that President Trump's endorsement is the kiss of death right now. Uh, he's got a pretty good record of endorsements that he's made. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, at the height of the election when he when he lost the presidency in New Mexico, I think with the economy the way it is, the oil and gas folks, I think there's a lot of people who may be just as frustrated with the outcome of the last presidential election. And even some were thinking maybe Trump wasn't so wrong. They may not like him, but his policies may not have been so wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think it does give a little bit of help, but definitely on the fundraising aspect. Okay. I think that it'll pour some more money in statewide. Mm -hmm. But here's the interesting part. I don't know how it hurts him because they've painted him as a Republican Trump supporter from day one. Good point. So it's not like this is a revelation where where he's run saying, I don't believe in Trump. I don't like Trump. And now we got this gotcha thing. Mm -hmm. They painted him in a box as being a, a Trumpista and he just sort of ignored it. And now he's got this, this, this confirmation. I'm not sure if president Biden coming helps the, the governor or hurts the governor. I could tell you, you know, I think, I think that they're wrong on the way they're handling the abortion issue. I think bringing Kamala Harris in, I think in a heavy Catholic state, I don't think that people are uh, necessarily 100% pro-life, mm -hmm. but I do think that people are not as pro-choice as what we're hearing people like the vice president, the president are advocating for. So I, I do think if there's anybody who's going to potentially have a downfall of getting an endorsement by a president, a former president, or having work done, I think it could affect the sitting governor a little bit. I still believe she's going to win the election by four or five points. Mm -hmm. I still believe the ground game that Democrats have in New Mexico right now is far superior than whatever if they even have a green ground game at the Republican let, Party, let, let me ask, Let me ask Dave this about uh, the ground game. Um, as we all know, or might not know, uh, Mr. Ronchetti is in the middle of a 42 stop tour across the state looking for independents and Democrats. Uh, you know what I mean? As Laura mentioned just a second ago, I, again, these last minute pushes can be effective, certainly, Dave. But what do you make of Mr. Ronchetti's tactic here? You know, with this much vote banked already, I mean, I think one of the things that you have to look at for all of these nom for all of these races that are running right now, I mean, when I saw Kamala Harris and President Biden both showing up in New Mexico, I thought, okay, they're looking for bandwagons that are going to deliver, that the governor's going to get reelected, that's going to make it, they can chalk that up as a win because they went and helped, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know, I just don't think they're on Ketty, you know, and this is this is a complaint about both sides of the aisle. Politics is about ideas. What are we going to do to make the state safer? What are we going to do to make Albuquerque safer? What are we right. going to do to make sure that there's more economic opportunity? And we just don't hear this. We hear it's just, you know, this we bash them because they're a Democrat about, you know, they're, they're killing babies. And, the you know, and the Republicans are like, well, we're not doing that. We're, that's against our values. And then, you know, ultimately we end up electing people that don't do anything. They just, you know, these cultural issues yep. really i just don't think are good tools for running for office but you know yep. i like ideas i like here's what i'm going to do that's you're about it you're about it um guys some other races going on statewide of course democrats have firm leads Berlio county dis da raul torres is leading the attorney general's race by about 10 points according to that albuquerque journal poll recently that's as the advertising in his race of course gets more nasty and so, Laura, is it too much for Jeremy Gay to make Jeremy Gay to make up at this point? Uh, Ten points is an awfully big lead going into the last weekend. It's definitely a huge disadvantage for him at this point. He he just doesn't have the name ID mm -hmm. is one issue, right? And and he has not been up on you know on TV as much as Raul has been. Raul had a tough primary 
Um, he was up early in that race mm -hmm. and uh, got his name out there. Just being, you know, the DA in Bernalillo County means he has more name ID. Now there's negatives too, because right. some people blame him for the crime issue okay. as much as they blame the mayor and the police department. Mm -hmm. um, but, but has it, I, has it stuck? I mean, he's blamed, he but it can, right. you know, right. yeah. No, I don't think so. And when you look at his um, experience, right, he's, mm -hmm. he's had, he's been a prosecutor, the DA for the last um, however long. And then he was a federal prosecutor before that. He's got the credentials to be able to, you know, say credibly, you know, this, I'm, I'm well qualified for this position. Now, Jeremy Gay, I think, has some some good credentials on his side, too, but he represents or he's from such a small part of the state that it's harder to get his name out there. And good I think point. he's already sort of swimming upstream on that. It's going to be hard for him to make that that uh, huge margin up. Um, Daniel, can you do this in 30 seconds? How about Maggie Toulouse Oliver? She has a 15 point lead. Are you surprised Good. by that? Maggie yeah, Toulouse who's her Oliver? opponent? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, but I think I think that's an interesting deal on the difference between the AG and the attorney general's race. Right. Yeah. We're saying the AG Republican candidate has no name recognition, yet he's within 10 points. We have a secretary of state race with a Republican who has no name ID. She's down by 15. Oh, so it just deal. shows yeah. you how bad the Republican Party is at reading the tea leaves. You have someone that has no name recognition is almost within single point digits of striking. Had you come out after the primary where, where Raul was attacked and continued to paint him in the box that he was painted in the primary right. and build your positives, you cannot come out, especially with early and absentee voting two weeks before running TV and expect to be a, a legitimate uh, candidate. That's a good point. Dave made that point earlier. A lot of these votes have been cast already. That's the new trend by mail, up to 30% of them. Thank you to our line opinion panel. We'll be back here at the virtual roundtable in a little over 10 minutes to talk about the congressional races tightening up across the state. But first, a conversation with the governor. Now, leading up to election day, we worked to bring you interviews with every major candidate, but after reaching out multiple times to Libertarian Karen Bedoni, Republican Mark Ronchetti, and Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, only the governor accepted our request. The governor was recently in Las Cruces where she spoke with Anthony Moreno. He is director of content at our sister station, KRWG. Here's Anthony. One big issue is public safety in New Mexico. There's a lot of concern in not only this race, but other races across New Mexico about public safety in our state. If reelected, what steps will you take to improve public safety? Well, we're going to make sure that we continue on the path that we've been on, and I want to make sure that folks are, you know, really aware of what those steps have been and why they're critical. And of course, crime is now a national issue that's requiring, and it does deserve that attention, to really focus on what's gone wrong. So here's what went wrong, number one. You have to invest in public safety. If you're not going to invest in officers and their training and their equipment, then you put yourself in a position that that for any hardship, any issue, anything that changes, you don't have enough folks in growing communities, right, to keep us safe. Two, we have a number of firearms that are flooding our communities, our neighborhoods. We know that is a risk. We need states to really keep up with that. And so just in those two issues alone, in addition to making sure that dangerous repeat offenders need to stay uh, in jail and in prison longer. Uh, we've done work on all three. Now you've been vocal about revisiting bail reform mm -hmm. in the state. Yeah. Uh, other lawmakers, prosecutors have voiced the need for it. Uh, what's your plan for this and how do you think it could be used where it's not discriminating against folks who may be living in poverty? Well, you're the first uh, uh, person interviewing me who's gotten to the other side of that issue. And I have to say, I really appreciate that because there are two sides to this. Uh, this is a state, along with many other states, that quite frankly was discriminating against individuals who were too poor to bail out. And remember, these can be uh, innocent individuals, right? That's how our Constitution is based. There's a presumption of innocence. They're raising their families. Maybe it's the uh, uh, head of the household, single parent. So there's some issues uh, we wanted to make sure, and it usually falls on the folks who get held, or minority men and women, and it's not applied uh, as equally it appears, and that's a constitutional problem. That's why New Mexico changed that in our Constitution, that the presumption is you shouldn't be held. Right? That's how it shifted. There's a presumption that no one arrested until trial should be arrested. 
then judges have the discretion using prosecutorial information, prior issues, right, prior arrests, convictions, to assess risk. In my view, given so many issues, assessments are only as effective as the conditions that they were built to try to apply to. Each case is unique and different, and I want to go to the federal system, which just reverses the presumption, which is, if you're dangerous, so you use, right, a firearm, it's a homicide, uh, you're a repeat violent offender, aggravated battery, as an example, these are individuals where the presumption is you are too dangerous in the community pending a trial and it's rebuttable so if a public defender says that's not true you know it's not this is the person's innocent this is what occurred not a risk then you can always have that individual not stay in jail pending trial that's the federal system and I've seen no evidence that that system doesn't provide clarity right the kind of sub substantive uh, uh, outcomes that keep communities safer and that we know what those standards are. In a 60-day session with a year in between and with additional information about what we're doing in public safety, I think it stands a better shot, but I want to tell you it's a heavy lift for people who worry that it may reverse us back to a place of discrimination. Um, I'm still going to call for it and I'm going to fight like hell to make sure that we get it over the finish line. The pandemic impacted us in so many ways. Uh, there's been a lot of data out about just how our young ones were impacted. A lot of children across the country in New Mexico lost parents, loved ones, guardians. How do we address mental health for are most vulnerable. When I was the Secretary of Health in 2004, uh, we uh, had a couple of school-based health centers, and by the time I uh, uh, was doing something else three years later, there were 68, and they were incredibly robust. Uh, shortly thereafter, all the behavioral health came out of those school-based health centers, and we went back to about 25. So we've been building those up, and I'm feeling uh, even more confident about the ability to do comprehensive, right, behavioral health services inside schools. It also means you need social workers and counselors. So we've seen an increase in the number of social workers. We hired 80 at Children, Youth, and Families Department recently. We're now partnering with uh, universities like this one, and specifically Highlands, who specialize in social work training, so it's a new recruitment program and training program specific to school age populations and to CYFD, and it's working. I want to move on to another yeah. issue, of course, climate change impacting us all. Uh, if reelected, what is your next step to take on climate change well, in our I, state? I want you to make sure I get a chance to talk about what we have yeah, done I, because I, we are a, we are an international leader on addressing the climate crisis and being really clear about protecting our air, land, uh, and water. And so New Mexico has very robust methane rules, which basically means uh, we're not going to pollute the air. That's a, a, a that is one of the worst, right, greenhouse gases, and when that comes right off oil and gas, we don't let you flare anymore, and we don't let you emit methane and now ozone. So the federal government has taken New Mexico's rules, which were adopted in a bipartisan and coordinated strategic effort with oil and gas so that we know that they're working. It's also brought jobs and more money to the state of New Mexico. So those are two huge areas, but we also have a climate change task force that's uh, been highlighted around the country as one of the most robust. So we're capping right, we're doing abandoned wells, we're doing healthy soil. This university is leading in the country and making sure that soil, which does carbon capture all by itself, is being engaged in a more productive and specific way and we're also doing conservation so that we're really clear about what that looks like for generations of New Mexicans we've been investing in cleaning hundreds of millions of dollars in cleaning water brand new infrastructure dealing with problems in wastewater dealing with some of our septic tank issues all around the state and there's more so that's our record to date where we're going is largely, uh, we asked for a geo bond to consider in the last session uh, a conservation fund, which is also an environmental climate crisis tackling effort. It's all of the above. Uh, instead of a geo bond question, I think we're likely to ask for a sizable investment in a set aside fund, like our early childhood fund, which will invest in those efforts, uh, including getting at our forests. I mean, the issue is it's hotter 
and drier. So we need better stewardship, and I'm sure you're aware the federal government has said we think they're liable for one of the worst fires in our history, but they've also said New Mexico stewardship programs, which we've launched, are some of the best in the country, and they're going to allow us to get back into our forests and make them healthier. Facing those those disasters that we face, yeah. two of the most uh, the largest wildfires in our state this year, what are some things that you took away from that experience and how it impacted New Mexico that uh, you think may help us avoid this in the future? What are some things the state can do? Well, a couple of things. Um, I'd love to avoid every natural disaster, and I would love to avoid that it's not just an extreme drought here. This state and the West uh, is undergoing aridification. So let's be earnest, because we've ignored, right, as a planet, and we've ignored as a country that the climate crisis is real. I mean, even in today's day and age, using science and evidence-based strategies. So we've decarbonized the utility sector. We've set those goals. We're investing in renewable energy, all of that makes a big difference. But we're going to have issue with fires, right? That isn't going to change overnight. And with that fire, in June of this year, 31 counties were on fire. So what do we do? We make sure that the investments out of the Inflation Reduction Act, right, $350 billion, it's a ton of money that we're going to invest in the kinds of evidence-based strategies that allow us to maintain a productive, safe footprint until we actually reverse the catastrophic effects of climate change to date. That's what we're going to do. I want to move on yeah. to education. Uh, a lot of issues in education. There's been some big concerns in recent years about keeping teachers in the classroom. The pandemic, of course, the impact that may have had on it. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. What is your plan uh, to continue with the efforts you've already put in place to keep teachers in the classroom if well, reelected. Let's talk about New Mexico State just released a pretty incredible study where they identified that we reduced uh, teacher vacancies in this last year by 34 percent. It's one of the best efforts in the country so I want to thank New Mexico State for putting out that independent information. So we do it by making sure that our current educators have loan forgiveness. Current educators right have access to affordable housing. Some cases if it's a hard to teach, hard to serve area, free housing. Uh, we're making sure that they're the highest paid educators now in the region. Uh, we'd like to do more. We're also making sure to educate new educators. That's free. So college is now free for educators. We have a program that endowed that now with opportunity scholarships. Un uh, this actual uh, university put out that the highest enrollment they've ever seen, right, is all because of that opportunity scholarships. Pretty incredible. So that is already having an impact, but it might be a place for me when you have a significant problem and you're building to the future, and we are, and we're doing that successfully, uh, which we're incredibly proud of. So smaller class sizes, deal with those vacancies, make sure that you aren't on at war with public education, have respect and dignity. If you want better outcomes, have more time in smaller classrooms with students. There are concerns about working age population leaving the state. What are the things that we need to do in this next legislative session? If you're reelected, what are some things that you're going to focus on to address that issue? Okay, well, kids are back in school. They're going to college. Older adults are going to colleges, more licenses, more businesses, more people staying here and moving here than ever before. Lowest unemployment in 14 years. Um, I think those numbers and outcomes really speak for themselves. I don't think you need a legislative action except this. We're going to keep investing. We've seen enormous job growth right here. I think you have a film school. Students are very excited about that. Uh, we're seeing jobs in rural areas like Chamberino, 300 jobs, uh, cannabis, the innovation in high tech. What, what young people and a workforce challenges, what they really need is to know that they can build careers in themselves. Last thing about a workforce, the whole country is going to have to figure out a couple of key challenges, long-term care, caregiving, and ag, and we've made incredible investments to build opportunities for young farmers in New Mexico, and I'm beginning to see that it's paying off. Thank you to KRWG and Anthony Moreno for that interview. You can watch Anthony's entire 27-minute conversation with the governor on KRW2, uh, KRWG's YouTube page. Now let's bring back our line opinion panelists again as we shift our focus to New Mexico's three congressional districts. 
Recent polling from the Albuquerque Journal shows Democrats leading in all three races, the closest being Congressional District 2, where Gabe Vasquez holds a slight two-point lead over incumbent Yvette Harrell. But different sources, like an Emerson College poll, show Ms. Harrell with a double-digit lead. And Daniel, these kind of things are hard to parse. Got to ask you from your gut here a little bit. Last week, when I asked a different group of panelists who stood the best chance of knocking off an incumbent, the consensus was Gabe Vasquez. Is that still the case in your mind? Yeah, I don't think so. I think yeah. that uh, I think that the one thing so down south, Las Cruces has really kind of changed the CD2 district. As you know, CD2 mm -hmm. was a staunch conservative Republican district with the with Las Cruces turning more progressive, more left. It's become a bigger player. But what I do find is that, you know, those pro oil and gas, those pro ag, those rural New Mexico folks, uh, Gabe is just, you know, Gabe is way too far left, I think, for for those folks. I don't think he's I don't think that the uh, progressive group of the Democrat Party has enough stroke in CD2 to make a difference, mm. to make up for the hardcore moderate Democrat conservatives and Republican conservatives that will go after and go support Yvette Harrell. I think she's I think she'll wind up winning by a significant amount. Mm -hmm. Laura, interestingly, out of all the three congressional races, candidates in CD2 have raised the most money. With Ms. Harrell pulling in more than four million and Gabe Vasquez at over 3.2 million, you know, both campaigns are airing, like I got to say, television ads attacking each other in the final days. We can't get away from them. But here's the question. Does Ms. Harrell's fundraising edge give her an advantage ahead of Election Day, that final push that always spends a lot of money? That's for sure. Right. Well, I mean, the media buys often have to be done so far in advance that it's not necessarily something mm -hmm. that you can very quickly turn up if you get a lot more um, right. influx of money. Sometimes you can, mm -hmm. uh, but there are media buys that have to occur prior to that. And so some of that, to a certain extent, is set. But there's also radio. Radio is still effective in a lot of these smaller towns. Yep. Um, you know, the local retail politics in, in a lot, especially in CD2, I think, is super important. Well, one thing to keep in mind, this particular poll was um, had a total of 625 voters who were polled. Um, the less people you poll, the higher the potential, <clears throat> the potential margin of error, right? As opposed to the Emerson poll that came out, that one was a thousand people right. um, statewide. And so, you know, that that's an issue. And I would, I, I haven't looked exactly at the cross tabs for this poll. I haven't looked at it in detail, but I will say this, there are a lot of people in you know, after redistricting that are in Albuquerque and the South Valley on the west side, I am now in CD2, which is weird to be in the same district as my hometown and as my fiance's hometown. It's just it's weird. Yeah. But um, but those particular, um, you know, those voters are going to make a difference in this election, potentially. And so you have to consider, you know, are they were they also part of this poll or did they did they only poll likely voters from or voters who had who had cast ballots in this in this congressional district in 2018 and 2020, because if they only vote, you know, they did not capture the folks who are now in there that used to be in CD1. Right. So that's a question. And I think that that's something I would want to explore a little bit further to consider what, you know, how accurate this particular poll was. Mm -hmm. But I, I do know that what was interesting to me is I saw that the journal endorsed Gabe Vasquez, which is really surprising. I expected him, I mean, they endorsed Ronchetti, so I would have expected right. them to endorse um, Harrell and they didn't, they endorsed Vasquez. So all three of the Democrat congressional seats were um, endorsed by the journal. Um, no, so they, uh, they, CD1, I thought was the Republican. I thought they endorsed uh, the one in Albuquerque. I thought they endorsed early was the Republican lady. I thought. Yeah, Holmes. I thought all three of them were, we, we can double check that, but yeah. either way, I know that for Gabe Vasquez, because that really caught my eye to see an endorsement from the journal for him. Oh, yeah. And you know, the fact that both are, I'm not surprised that there's so much money being spent in that race as opposed to the other two, because there are outside forces that are putting money in both on both sides of the aisle. There's a lot more money coming in. They're showing up on national watch lists. It's just yeah. such a, a divisive um, DC environment right now that every seat is up for grabs and they're really looking to try to make as much of an impact in those seats that are gettable. Mm -hmm. And so the Democrats are targeting it, which then means that the Republicans are also trying to defend that seat. And all three were Democrat endorsements, uh, just to confirm there. Hey, David, interestingly, when you think about it, uh, Ms. Harrell won by seven points over Xochitl Torres Small back when, uh, back when, 2020. And right. just to kind of toss that uh, aside there for a quick second. But let me ask you this. The two Democratic incumbents in the other districts seem to be overcoming what were expected to be more competitive district lines, as Laura just mentioned, that included more conservative areas of the state. But that right. said, Michelle Garcia Holmes is only down six points to Melanie Stansbury, according to that journal poll. Is there anything right. Ms. Garcia Holmes can do to make up that I mean, gap in the final days? 
like all things, if you keep running, you just keep getting more and more name recognition, which she's been running. She ran for mayor. She was in the Senate race. Um, you know, and, and I think that the, the whole idea of this redistricting, it was a bit of a bold move what they did, you know, how they did it. The Democrats controlled it completely. They controlled the legislature. The governor signed off on it. The question is, will it work? You know, um, up north, there was some complaint by that candidate that they had made her district more competitive for Republicans. Right. That doesn't seem to be the case when you start looking at the polling. So, you know, the question, too, is when you're talking about the endorsements by the journal, do these endorsements matter? That's what I keep wondering. I mean, do we know, like, did the television stations endorse? Do they endorse? Right. Does it matter if they endorse? I mean, that's the whole thing. And then just for a number to throw out there. There was a number out this morning, $16.7 billion have been spent on these midterm races nationwide. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money when you look at it. So, you know, it's like, I mean, really, it's incredible. So That's we'll Gene Grant it. revenue kind of money right there. That's <laughs> Gene Grant income right there. That's right. It's huge amount of money you know so money is never an object That's when right. it comes to these races you make a good point dave that money corrupts you know that kind of a thing hey dan let me ask you this about district three another second time candidate struggling up there journal polling showing incumbent democrat teresa ledger fernandez 18 point lead over republican challenger alexis yes. martinez johnson you know i think i think she is one mm -hmm. of those people that she's local to the area i think she's done a very good job she mm -hmm. seems to be well liked and you know, basically, it's a it's a ninety six percent of all congressmen are reelected. She's going to be right in there, you know. Just she's going to keep that seat for as long as she wants. Daniel, what do you think? Did uh, Alexis Martinez Johnson coming at thirty five percent and uh, the incumbent at fifty three percent? The district was supposed to be more competitive than this. What what happened there? It's not more competitive. It's it's still a heavy Democrat district. I still believe at the end of the day that. I think CD, the CD3 and CD2 were both extremely strong Democrat and Republican seats. And what I think they did was they chipped off a little of the liberal side, a little of the conservative side mm -hmm. of both those districts and put them into CD1, which I don't think they made CD3 or CD2 that much more competitive. I think they made CD1 more competitive back to the day when they had, you know, your former boss, who, by the way, is the recipient of all that money at UTEP, the president of UTEP, Heather Wilson. 40 million. Um, yeah. And Heather Wilson, she's knocking the ball out of the park 40 miles across the state line. So I think uh, I don't think, you know, I think they've made the seats more competitive on paper. But, you know, when you start getting in on, you know, when you start talking about redistricting, you look at voter tendencies, you look at demographics. I mean, we know that you can put a whole bunch of Democrats in one district. But if you don't put enough with the same race, then they don't get the same outcome. So, you know, it's easy to say, hey, listen, we've you know, we've made this district more competitive by voters. But, you know, or we've made this district more competitive by ethnicity. Right. But if you don't get the right combination, it really doesn't do much to change the outcome of the elections. That's a very good point there. Very interesting. Hey, Laura, got to get this in before we get out of here. We talked about the importance of turnout in state state races. What about here? Because, again, you know, as Dave mentioned before, Early voting and everything else that goes with it is very impactful these days. We've got a lot of votes in and counted already. Right. I mean, the early voting is trending Democrat. The absentee ballot tends to be fairly evenly split. Well, it has in the past, but, you know, it does. It, the Republicans edge out a little bit in the absentee ballot. They're, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's an older demographic that tends to use absentee ballots. Election day itself um, is often hugely Democrat. People yeah. still love to go to the poll. I don't know why, because you stand in line in many cases. Right. And I like to get that out of the way. But that's going to be, I think it's going to be a long night that we're going to be waiting for results to come in from certain um, certain areas. Right. So, um, so, you know, I still think that I agree with Dan that Michelle Lujan Grisham is going to edge it out. Um, but I think we're just going to be a long night sort of waiting for those final results to come in. Good points there. Thanks again to our line opinion panelists. We'll be right back here for our final discussion of the day in a little over 10 minutes when we talk about the new oil and gas drilling approved near Chaco Park. But before we get into that, our final candidate conversation of the election season with Democratic challenger for, Cong for Congressional District 2, Gabe Vasquez. Over the last two months, we made multiple calls and sent several emails to Yvette Harrell's campaign she never got back to a response back to our request for an interview. For that reason, Gwyneth Dolan's interview with Gabe Vasquez is our only candidate conversation for CD2. Here's Gwyneth. Gabriel Vasquez, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. 
This year we have seen a record high influx, influx of migrants at the border, many of them fleeing environmental, economic, crime-related problems in Central and South America. You are a first-generation American with roots in Juarez. What do you see as the main issue that we face at the border? Well, look, we're seeing a lot of instability, not just at our border, but all across this world, all across this country, in the Central Triangle, uh, in, North, in um, Central America as well. And it's unfortunate, but uh, people look to the United States as that beacon of hope, that beacon of light, um, the place where they can come and start a better life. Uh, but those aren't the only issues. For us, we've seen an influx of migration on and off over the years for decades. But unfortunately, both parties have not been able to come together to work towards solutions that create the comprehensive immigration reform that is predictable, that is humane, that gives people opportunity, and that keeps our border safe and keeps our community safe. Now, I had a chance to work on that last bill that the Senate actually uh, worked on, Senate Bill 744. That was a, a bipartisan bill with four Democrats, four Republicans. Unfortunately, it was killed in the House by then Speaker John Boehner. And since then, we haven't been able to come together as, uh, as a country and unfortunately as a Congress. And so that's something I'm committed to doing. And as the second largest congressional border district in the country, it's something that we should be leading on. Now, with my experience growing up on the other side of the border, but being born in this country and having parents that also worked uh, to benefit the national economy, although working on uh, nearshoring opportunities in the maquiladora industry in Ciudad Juarez, uh, I understand the complexities of not just the asylum seekers and the need to fund our immigration courts, but the opportunity to grow our international trade with our uh, partners in places like San Jerónimo and Ciudad Juárez and down in Santa Teresa. So the complexities of border and border um, policies are much more complex than what we're just seeing today. Uh, there's many layers that go underneath those, and that also includes foreign diplomacy, international aid to foreign countries like Guatemala, like El Salvador, so that folks that are fleeing the violence there, that are fleeing uncertain economic uh, conditions, many of them climate refugees, that they have support in their country so that they can feel safe and they can have jobs in their home country. But right off the bat, we have to keep our border community safe. And then secondly, we have to make sure that these asylum seekers who are coming here uh, in very large numbers have an opportunity at a fair shot in court as they do in this country that means more immigration judges and a more robust funded uh, immigration court system. Uh, voters say crime is one of their top issues right now. You said in a 2020 interview, we need serious police reform <clears throat> in this country. It's not just about defunding the police. It's about defunding a system that privileges white people above everybody else. Do you support defunding the police? So 100% I do not support defunding the police. And in fact, when I was a city councilor four years in a row, I voted to increase the police budget. I worked directly with our police chief uh, as, as the co-chair of our Public Safety Policy Review Committee in the city of Las Cruces to make sure that we were actually creating community policing programs that helped support public safety initiatives, uh, including the LCPD CARES program, which I helped start with the Las Cruces Police Department. So in addition to adding funding to our police department, yes, we also looked at different models of how we could comprehensively care, especially for those members of our community that had mental health issues or that had other, pro, uh, other uh, issues that increased their recidivism within our criminal justice system so that they wouldn't come back out on the streets and re recommit or reoffense um, in our community. So, uh, no, I do not support that. Uh, and in fact, that comment was about that people weren't protesting after the murder of George Floyd to defund the police. They were protesting to defund a system that has irre irreparably hurt people of color in this country for many years, including here in New Mexico. Now, that's one thing I'm very proud of is that as a public servant, as somebody who has stood by my community, is that I will be out there with folks. I have been out there with folks when injustices occur. That is what I think we need in a good leader. That is what I think we need in a good congressional representative, is somebody who's willing to stand with the people uh, when we need change in this country or in our communities, but then is actually willing to work across the aisle, and in my case, go to Congress to help fix some of these issues. Speaking about crime, uh, it's related to drugs often. We're experiencing an epidemic of fentanyl, and much of it brought across the border legally by U.S. citizens traveling legally. How do you stop that? Well, I think we need to look at first where these drugs are coming from, right? And I think it's through our legal ports of entry. The majority of drugs that are coming in from the El Paso port of entry, Santa Teresa port of entry, Palomas, Columbus port of entry, those, those are the facts. 
And so we need to make sure we have the technology to be able to detect the smuggling of fentanyl at our ports of entry. That means by both pedestrian and vehicle crossings. So when we talk about investing in border security, it's not about a wall. It's about agents and it's about technology and it's about people on the border who can protect uh, our communities by making sure these drugs don't get in in the first place. I would rather work directly with Customs and Border Protection and our law enforcement experts to make sure that we're catching the drugs where they're coming from. That's called smart border enforcement. And yes, you're right. These drugs, I mean, whether it was fentanyl or methamphetamines or heroin, have always wreaked havoc in our communities. But we have to make sure we tighten up our legal ports of entry where these drugs are being crossed. And for those, especially American citizens uh, who engage in this drug trafficking activity, there needs to be real consequences for them. Because what's at stake is the lives of our families, of our kids, people here in Albuquerque, I mean, people in Las Cruces. And it's unacceptable to me uh, that we give a slap on the wrist to somebody who would cause such harm to our community. So we need to look at those laws and work with our state legislators uh, to make sure we're addressing this issue adequately and protecting our families. Guns are uh, a major issue in violent crime, and uh, we are struggling with this in mm -hmm. New Mexico. Do you believe that more gun control will reduce the problems that we're having with crime? Well, I don't want to refer to it as gun control. I think it's gun safety legislation. It's common sense gun safety legislation. Now, I'll say I'm a firearm owner myself. Uh, right now in my garage, I have a gun safe uh, with several firearms that I use for hunting and for self-defense. That's the family I grew up in, that's how I grew up. Many New Mexicans grew up the same way. But I also grew up as a responsible gun owner and what to do and what not to do. Now for me personally, um, I don't own semi-automatic firearms uh, that some folks say should be banned in this country uh, because I personally have no need for them. Um, I can kill a deer, or I can kill an elk uh, with a rifle and I can defend my home uh, with a handgun. And I think for many of us in New Mexico, that's how we grew up. And so it's not about controlling people's ability to have guns. It's about keeping our community safe. And that's why I call it gun safety legislation, because those folks that have mental health issues, those folks who have uh, domestic orders of protection against their spouses or against their girlfriends or other who, uh, who have committed domestic violence, uh, those folks who have proven uh, perhaps that they cannot handle a firearm for one reason or another, through expanded background checks, that is what the, the solutions that we need to start with in this country. And the truth is, is that we make this a divisive uh, uh, um, issue in this election, it's never gonna happen. My solution is to work with Republicans across the aisle to start working on those common sense gun safety reforms and be aggressive about it too. Don't get me wrong, I also don't wanna kick the can down the road. I think things need to get done in short order, but there are things we can do in short order and, and make sure we keep our, keep our community safe. So if an assault weapons ban came up for a vote while you were in Congress, would you vote for or against? Well, I think that's part of the issue is with this um, talk about an assault weapons ban, right, is that that is much more complicated uh, than just the three words. Um, assault weapon needs to be defined first and foremost, right? A ban needs to be defined first and foremost. So I need to look at legislation to see what that meant. However, I can tell you, I know a lot of folks in this state um, who have different opinions about this issue, and especially in my district, in those rural parts of my, of my district, I wouldn't make any decision as an elected representative without making sure I spoke with everybody, veterans, with hunters, uh, with legal firearm owners, and enthusiasts, and those kinds of folks. Um, so I would need to read the bill before I made a decision on that. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham this year pledged $10 million to help build a new reproductive health care clinic in Dona Ana County. Uh, it, a clinic that will also provide abortions. What are your personal feelings about abortion? Oh, I just think that we have gone back in time to the dark ages in this country. Um, I think what the Supreme Court has done uh, is it's truly shameful. Um, and it's, let's face it, it's a Trump appointed extreme Supreme Court that has told more than 50% of people in this country that they can no longer have autonomy over their own body and their own health care decisions. For me, I am a proud protector of women's health care. I'm somebody who believes in the freedom in this country and that big government shouldn't be in your bedroom or in your doctor's office or making decisions on your behalf about your health care decisions. Those need to be left up to a doctor and the person who is experiencing or has a, a potential childbirth, period. I mean, that's where we need to stay. Redistricting made your district much more competitive. You'll have to win over some Republicans in order to get elected to Congress. How would you persuade a conservative voter that a liberal like you should represent them in Congress? 
Well, first, I tell people uh, I am not a liberal. I'm a New Mexico Democrat. And there's a very strong brand of New Mexico Democrats who have worked across the aisle to get things done for their communities. And that includes in our rural communities. Um, so I've worked you know, for many years in places like Deming, where I have the endorsement of the Republican mayor of Deming, Mr. Benny Hasso, or Lordsburg, or Silver City, or Alamogordo, where we just had 160 people show up in a room where we only expected 40 people to show up. And so I think what people are looking for is not partisanship in this election and in this race. They're looking for solutions and people who are willing to fight uh, for New Mexico and New Mexicans. And more importantly, people who don't have strings attached to them as people or to their campaigns. Now I tell people, look, I got a house, I have a dog. That's pretty much all I got. And I got a truck and I'm very proud of all three but I don't have any strings attached. I'm not doing this for any other reason other than to serve you, whether you're in Lemitar, whether you're in San Miguel, Chaparral, Las Cruces, or the South Valley of Albuquerque, I will treat you just the same. I will make sure that we bring home resources to your community because that's the job and that's the responsibility that it takes to run for Congress. Gabriel Vasquez, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you to Gwyneth for that interview. You can watch all of our candidate conversations online right now on the New Mexico and Focus YouTube page. And that includes interviews with candidates for Navajo Nation President, Congress, and Governor of New Mexico. Now let's welcome back to our line of opinion panelists for one final discussion this week. The Biden administration recently approved new oil and gas drilling near Chaco Park. It's something our Laura Pascas and our land have been covering for months. A legal challenge against the BLM and Interior Secretary Deb Holland is aiming to stop the project from moving forward. And Laura, these are Trump era leases that the Biden administration has said it would reconsider. Are you surprised they've been approved after that uh, statement they had asking to, re to reconsider? I, I was approved, to be honest. I, yeah. I mean, I think that certainly there's there's many people who supported um, the president in his uh, election last time around in 2020. And I think their expectation was that he would be a champion for um, uh, you know, protecting these kinds of sites uh, from fracking, uh, from oil and gas and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, uh, Deb Holland, when she uh, came out last year uh, to Chaco, right. and I think it was in November, actually, almost a year ago, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the sort of signal that they were sending, that they were going to, you know, not do things like the Trump era um, approval of those leases. And so I, I was surprised to see that that was that at some point changed. And I, I think they're going to get a lot of criticism as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Certainly these environmental groups have already challenged this in federal court. Yep. They're already looking to stop this. And, um, and I think they will have a, a reasonable argument to be made, um, certainly on historical and uh, cultural grounds, if not environmental concerns about this, um, this kind of fracking. Mm -hmm. You know, David, these are Trump era leases of sort, I'm sorry, that are span more than 70 square miles in Northwestern New Mexico. It's a big area. But the parcels right. in question are outside an informal 10 mile buffer zone around Chaco right. uh, that the agency had observed for years. Why is it so complicated? You know, it's it's complicated because I think it's one of those it's one of those areas where you can put your liberal credibility on the line and say we're against this. Yet mm -hmm. some, some of the players who directly affected the tribes, they want the jobs, you know, it was like the uranium mine. They wanted the jobs. So it's the. It's the old economic, you know, versus what's best. And, and, and it's difficult to know. So I think it's very interesting in light of like the Trump thing. It was horrifying that he did it. And yet here we are a few years later and the Democrat is doing it also because some of the players involved that will directly benefit from it are for it. So, you know, it's like <laughs> you have to make this sort of, you know, how do you decide what's good and what's bad and whatever. There's just it's just not any. There's just no one correct answer. There's always a gray area, which we constantly are swimming in. That's right. You know, Daniel, interestingly, I think most folks would be surprised, 90% of the greater Chaco landscape is already leased for oil and gas development. You know, and experts found that emissions, as a consequence, from drilling are causing health issues for residents. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management says it will allow public comment before it starts these new projects. So should these health concerns be taken more seriously? Tribe saying it should be. What do you think? Well, the tribes are not saying it should be. Uh, the Navajo Nation is in favor of doing this. As a matter of fact, they want it to be an even smaller zone than the than the ten mile zone because they they believe that the economic development is needed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you know at some point 
um, to Dave, to, to comments Dave made, you know, it, it, we can't be against everything and run to the deal and say, well, everybody's dying. This is killing everybody. We got climate change. We got climate control, pro climate change problems. And then, you know, you, then nobody's got a job. And right. so I think this is the question of, and then you know, now, you know, we've gone from energy independence to energy dependence. So I think, I think that people's opinion of things change by their desperation of things that they need. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, if you don't have a job, you're not sure you're going to have heat to, for your home and there's not jobs out in the area. I think at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people are getting tired of the anti-drilling crowd saying that, oh, drilling is killing everybody. It's the end of the world. When, you know, the reality is that the oil and gas industry continues to change, continues to grow, continues to put in all types of safeguards. Is it 100% safe? It's not. But you know what? You, you know, when they were drilling for uranium, nobody was telling those folks that you had the risk of dying of cancer uh, by drilling for uranium today you know i would i would make the argument that overwhelmingly oil and gas drilling sites are are pretty dadgum safe i mean they're out there with enough inspectors and safety equipment so i think people are are getting to the point where they're like do we want jobs or do we think that enough people are going to come up here and visit and get, keep us all fed and housed? And I think they're finding out that the latter is what they want. They mm -hmm. want good paying jobs that they can take care of their families with. Just for clarity, uh, Dan is quite right, uh, as opposed to what I just said, the, the Navajo Nation is in fact, have argued for an even smaller area, Laura, to be protected because the tribe and its citizens obviously benefit from oil and gas development. But here's the, the dichotomy here. What does this put the Biden administration and particularly our Secretary of the Interior, Holland, how does she navigate all these different perspectives? That's an awfully thin needle head to try to get something through here. It is. It's a very, very difficult needle to thread mm -hmm. in this situation for her. I mean, culturally, just in terms of, I mean, she's native. She's from Laguna Pueblo. She obviously has some very strong support among mm -hmm. tribal members. And there, I think there are arguments on both sides. The Navajo Nation definitely is, is pro this, uh, you know, and, and who can blame them? There's a lot of need for economic development in that region. Um, it's understandable the desire to have better paying jobs and to have more opportunities for the tribal members. But then there's other folks that that feel like from a cultural preservation standpoint, this is a sacred area. There's mm -hmm. a lot of tribes that feel like this right. is an area where they, they trace their roots to. Yeah. The other thing that's also important to recognize is this is an international dark sky park um, that it's been designated because over 99% of Chaco Park is actually um, you know, dark, naturally dark at night. And so with oil and gas uh, drilling increased, that means more potential flaring. It really affects that natural dark sky. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that do you know, stargazing and, and do tourism related to that, mm -hmm. that are going to be- <coughs> But one thing to keep in mind, you know, I, I don't want to minimize, I, I want to make sure to emphasize that the environmental analysis that has to go into this before it gets final approval is pretty extensive. I'm Bureau of Land Management as a federal agency has to oversee this process through NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, where basically they have to have scoping meetings on re in regular intervals, let people know that they're having these meetings where they're going to get feedback about the potential project. So I would expect that whatever the um, the potential uh, site is right now for some of these uh, oil and gas drilling, mm -hmm. it's going to change based on the scoping meetings that are under NEPA that will be conducted before final approval is given. So there is really a lot of opportunity for public input. Mm -hmm. So I expect there's going to be a lot of groups that are going to be organized and send people to those scoping meetings. Thanks again to our line panel as always this week. Be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics the line covered on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram pages and catch any episodes you may have missed on the PBS video app or your Roku or smart TV. Don't forget to vote if you haven't already. We'll be live as counts come in around the state on election night, starting at 8 p.m. on channel 5.4. I'll be speaking with some of our longtime political contributors and a group of New Mexico journalists out covering specific races. Again, that's eight o'clock, channel 5.4. We'll also stream our coverage on the New Mexico In Focus YouTube and Facebook pages. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you.